Good morning. My name is Michael McBride. I'm on the MGA Green Section and Executive Committee. I'm also a chair of the Greens Committee at Arcola. Um, and uh, we're happy to all have you here to talk about things that obviously interest you. Um, at Arcola, we hired a great superintendent four years ago, Paul Dottie. He was president of our state's uh, Golf Superintendent Association. He's, he's done just a, a tremendous job, and I've learned as my short tenure, tenure as the Greens Chairman, basically stay out of his way. I mean, he knows his business. Most green chairmen don't. Um, we, do, we basically try to keep within budget and keep the course in as good condition as we can. But um, what he's done at our call in four years is nothing less than phenomenal, and I really begin to understand how important superintendents are. Uh, the purpose of this section today is to, <coughs> to talk about topics that may be of interest to the MGA, <coughs> people involved with the green section and the superintendents. So we have a great program today. Um, I'm introducing uh, Mr. Adam Miller, it looks like Moeller, his last name, but it is Miller, he's from the USGA, to talk about the Poe Bent debate, um, playability, reliability, cost, et cetera. Um, he holds a degree from, in agronomy and horticulture from the University of Wisconsin, has a master's of science degree from Purdue University, was hired right out of Purdue University to work for the USGA. So he really is the expert on, I guess, horticulture, agronomy, et cetera, for the USGA. And I welcome him today to the seminar. Thank you. Okay, can everyone hear me uh, all the way in the back? I've got this. Uh, looks good. All right. Uh, I don't like the podium. It's kind of not me. I don't know. I, I move around a little bit too much. I think I have uh, adult ADD. So. Uh, hopefully we can uh, stay on point and, and you guys can follow me a little bit. I had two cups of coffee um, and that's usually one too many, so we'll, we'll see how this uh, works out. Uh, thanks for being here. Appreciate uh, everyone's attention. It's early in the morning, so uh, hopefully you guys have had the coffee because I have put people to sleep in the past, but we're going to try not to do that today. You know, looking outside, it kind of looks like spring. We're, we're getting there. Last year at this point, we were uh, well ahead of schedule. Uh, you know, a lot of people had uh, multiple rounds of golf under their belt, and, and this year it's a much different story. Um, when we're talking about our golf courses, especially in the spring, we were just joking up on stage that, you know, Augusta is coming up just around the corner, and with Tiger playing uh, at a high level, there's even more interest, in, and that has people thinking about golf, and, and more importantly, thinking about getting out of their golf courses, uh, you know, in the area. Uh, unfortunately, what a lot of professional uh, or televised golf events do is they, they set some expectations that are a little bit unrealistic. Uh, and that's where we break it down and get into our golf course situations in the Northeast. And no question, we've, we're dealing with the same kind of expectations uh, that are, you know, through the roof in some instances. Did the same presentation in Boston uh, just yesterday and, and nothing against the International Club, but, you know, I don't think their marketing folks are, are always working closely uh, with their ground staff uh, to understand the term flawless is really unattainable. Uh, with putting greens and that's that's where the focus should be on our golf courses and within golf course maintenance because three quarters of of all the shots in golf should be played to or around uh, or on the putting greens so uh, that's the focus but nonetheless flawless putting greens is is just impossible to attain uh, so here we've got a pretty good green this is actually uh, one of our colleagues in the southeast that's that's playing an ultra dwarf bermuda grass green um, he would argue that this is probably the best surface in the world not going to work for our environment um, but nonetheless, you know, he might make that putt, he might miss it. Uh, one way or the other, his round of golf is going to be affected by how he plays on the greens. And if he feels that the greens are perfect, he's going to be pretty satisfied. Like I said, though, it's, it's not attainable and it's certainly not a st a sustainable to have our putting greens at this peak condition throughout the whole year, to have them be perfect, they're flawless. Uh, it's just not possible. They're a living, breathing, uh, constantly changing grass system. So there's going to be ups and downs. Um, and again, they can be peaked for periods of time, like Augusta National will peak in a few weeks, like Marion will peak in mid-June. Um, but we can't have them peak at that same high level for the entire year. And how often you want them to peak is going to be based on what you're willing to pay for them and really what the infrastructure of your golf course can support. Because just because we want to have the surfaces play at a certain speed or a certain firmness, uh, doesn't mean that we have the right grasses to do so or the right uh, soils to do so. Uh, so it kind of boils down to what we're willing to pay and really what we want on our golf courses. And 
you know, the economic picture is, is improving for uh, golf courses in the U.S. and, and certainly in the Northeast, but uh, it's still not looking great. If we look, these are some statistics from the National Golf Foundation uh, that were released, I think, two months ago or so, and it shows uh, the amount of openings versus closings. And we've got a net loss of 141 golf courses in just 2012, and they're predicting this trend to continue, uh, where we're seeing, you know, 10 to maybe 20 new golf courses open a year, uh, but somewhere in the 130 to 150 range of golf courses closing each year. So it's pretty scary. And, and that's one of, the, one of the focuses with the green section is sustainability. And it's not just environmental sustainability, it's economic sustainability. And how we can uh, try to promote a, a more realistic um, management program for your golf courses so you can uh, withstand some of these challenges, losing members, you know, having golfers compete for, for all these rounds of golf is challenging. And, and within our management programs, we can adjust how effective uh, the golf course runs as a business and hopefully uh, how it survives in the long term. Um, as, I, as I alluded to earlier, you know, the focus is always going to be on our putting greens and that's really where the focus should be. Um, you branch off from there on the next most important playing areas, but we've really gotten um, far in excess of, of what is sustainable, I think, for many people to, to the inputs that we're throwing at our putting greens. Um, and it's not just the U.S. It, it is branching out into other places in the world, uh, but it's probably the most uh, most problematic in the U.S. And our, our golf turf managers, uh, even the general managers, the professionals, our entire goal is to provide, you know, what our clientele want, a good golfing experience, right? And that's a lot easier said than done based on the expectations a lot of our golfers have. Uh, we're trying to produce consistent, uniform conditions that are reliable on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, the grass is going to be there every single day. It's going to change in terms of its conditioning, uh, but it's something that's at least reliable and we know is going to hang on. Uh, unfortunately, with a lot of that, you know, we want reliable turf that's consistent, uniform, smooth. Our golfers are often focused on one main thing, and that's speed. And Dave Otis is going to talk more about speed a little bit later today, but I will say it is primarily a problem in North America. It's branching out into other parts of the world, definitely, where speed seems to dictate everything. Uh, but I've spent a little bit of time in, in the UK and firmness, smoothness, by far and away, their number one priority. Speed is a big deal for some people over there, but it's not nearly uh, quite, as, um, quite as important for, for most of uh, their golfers as it is to our golfers in the US. Uh, so this is not my son, this is actually a colleague's son uh, that he took stimping the green. That's number 17 at St. Andrews. Uh, during the Dunhill Links Championship. So, uh, needless to say, we didn't take his numbers when we were looking at uh, green speed for, for that particular green. Um, but uh, again, so that's, that's one of the scary parts about golf is this is where uh, the trend continues to go. And again, Dave will talk a lot about that a little bit later. Um, so within our putting greens, we can do so much. Uh, we can you know, try to peak them for certain parts of the year. And as I alluded to before, sometimes you have a good infrastructure that'll support more, uh, more consistent playing conditions at a higher level, and other times you don't. And one of the key fundamentals with what we have to work with is our grass populations. And my goal was not to try to educate uh, all the non-superintendents of the room as to you know, how to identify one grass from another and, and all these key, key characteristics between the two, but the point is to bring attention to the fact that there are two main grasses that we're dealing with on our putting greens in the Northeast. Uh, oftentimes they're found in conjunction with, with one another. Um, Rarely are they 100% of your greens are going to be one grass. Uh, so the first one that we're dealing with is uh, primarily poannua on our putting greens. That's a really common grass in this area. It's actually a weed. We've never planted poannua really on our greens. It just sort of moved in over time. Uh, the other one is creeping bank grass, by far and away the preferred species. But um, we just don't see it in, in very high populations in the Northeast because of various reasons. And then again, there's going to be most greens in the Northeast are a combination of a mixed poa and bent grass stand, whether they're 50%, 50%, 75, 25, you name it, all sorts of combinations. Um, and just a general uh, kind of thought process, if your golf course is more than 20 years old, chances are you're primarily a poa annua uh, golf course on your putting greens. If it's 1 to 15 years old, you probably have mostly bent grass on your greens. Um, but that, that might not be... Um, be a perfect scenario. 
So Poania, it can be uh, Poania or mostly Poa surfaces, a pole bent green can be really, really good. This is Beth Page, number 17, right before the US Open 2009. Can provide really good playing conditions, no question. Actually, if you look specifically, this is the, the Golf Digest report, 100 of uh, America's Greatest Golf Courses, released this past year. You look one through 10, seven out of the 10 are actually POA golf courses. The other three, Augusta, Marion, and Sandhills, are all creeping bent grass. So POA can be really, really good, no question. Uh, Augusta has awesome greens. Marion, those bent grass greens are really good. And uh, Sand Hills, I actually haven't been there, but I know those are uh, pretty good from some colleagues that have talked to me as well. So uh, not saying bent grass isn't as good as Poania. It's just, you know, at this point, Poania can make a really good surface. If you look at this list, there's 10, 10 clubs. They all have something in common. Anyone have any idea? They also, I should say, this, this was pointed out to me yesterday, all 10 of those clubs have gone through extensive tree management programs where their green sites have been opened up dramatically. They've got a lot of sunlight, a lot of air movement on those putting greens. Uh, but Poiania is good. It's expensive to maintain at a high level consistently. And even if you're investing an awful lot of resources in it, it's still going to be unreliable. Um, and we've seen that with a few of those clubs having issues here or there uh, in the past with losing parts of their, their greens. and, and um, Again, it can be really good, but it also has some major issues. So we look at that list, and like I said, most courses in here probably are dealing with mostly Poania. Um, you know, your superintendents are in a tough spot, no question there. And your golfers are just kind of, hey, just, just read the Golf Digest. You know, we've got, we've got Poa, why can't we be, be like those guys, right? Um, doesn't quite work that way. So why not Poa? I said it can be good, no question. When it's good, it's good. There isn't really an in-between with POA. It's either good or it's bad. Um, it has very little tolerance for any sort of environmental stress. So we've seen issues with winter. That's the top left corner. Um, summer is the, the top right. More summer issues, um, bottom right and, uh, and bottom, uh, bottom right and bottom left. So uh, it can be good, but again, it's, it's pretty intolerant. Uh, we've pretty well documented over 80, 80 years or so of the green section. It's got major summer and winter reliability issues. Despite your best efforts, it can die on you. Um, there's some playability limits, too, because it doesn't tolerate the heat quite as well as bent grass. So you have to back off more. You, know, you have to be more conservative with this grass in the summer, and you're going to be more apt to, to backing off your management programs with it than bent grass. Um, also, there's a little bit differences. It produces a seed head, which we'll touch on. And that can change how well it plays throughout the, uh, especially the springtime. Uh, known pest issues, we've known that for a while, that it's, it's more susceptible to diseases and insects. And then the question was raised, you know, with all these challenges, how much more does it cost? And we really didn't have that documented until recently. I actually worked with um, my former major professor at Purdue University, Cale Bigelow. Uh, so he put together a lot of these, uh, these numbers but he, he documented general maintenance programs for putting greens, creeping bank grass versus Poania greens. And this, a lot of this input was provided by uh, myself, Dave Otis, Jim Skorowski, and a couple of others um, more closer to Purdue University. Uh, so this is the full length article. It's more technical, more based on superintendents' um, knowledge of, of golf course maintenance, but it's still a good read for the non-superintendents in the audience. So we're gonna just kind of review a few of these things and document some of the, the weaknesses within Poania. All right, so before we get into some of the specifics, there are some generalities. We're assuming here that everyone's working with about the same size, putting greens, labor costs, fuel are, are about the same, things like that. Uh, we couldn't account for every little difference. Uh, fans are becoming increasingly popular in the Northeast, and there's an expense to these. Some golf courses have them, some golf courses don't. Um, but that's, you know, some of these expenses, we just couldn't account for everything. Uh, so when we started putting this together, we just made a list of what do we typically do to our putting greens on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, things like that. Are we maintaining the greens or are we really producing a surface? Are we just mowing them and that's it? Or are we really trying to groom them so they're smooth, firm, and, and maybe uh, at a certain speed? So we've got a routine daily practices like mowing, irrigation, fertilizing, um, you know, other programs that are done maybe uh, a couple times a week or every few weeks with rolling, grooming, changing the holes, top dressing, 
uh, longer uh, or larger scale maintenance programs like core aeration, drainage work, and then finally pest management. Uh, so no question, we spend an awful lot of money mowing our greens. They're three acres. They're one of the smallest parts of our golf course on the, on the whole scale. Um, but per square foot, we're investing so much more money into these surfaces, and, and rightfully so, as I mentioned. But a lot of that goes just into mowing the greens. Um, and this doesn't have anything to do with the species comparison between bentgrass and poa, but I just wanted to introduce you to this concept because I know it's been gaining a lot of popularity. Uh, the idea of putting green mowing versus rolling, alternating between these two. Uh, we used to use rolling always in conjunction with mowing because you'll see an, uh, an increase in smoothness and an increase in speed. But with the stress that we've had over the past few summers, we've learned that if we mow one day and just roll the greens the next day, we actually see a uh, healthier turf and we save a lot of money in doing so, uh, assuming you're walk mowing your putting greens. If you're using triplex mowers or ride on mowers in your putting greens, there's a cost savings, but it's not quite as significant. Uh, so I know this is going to be hard to read for most people in the back, um, and that's what's nice is we're providing the, uh, the information for you here. But if you just look at your single cutting your greens every day or just about every day throughout the summer, uh, probably about 160 to 180 times throughout the season, you're going to probably spend almost forty to fifty thousand dollars just on mowing the putting greens uh, versus rolling. If you're only using one roller operator, you might be spending you know a little over uh, twenty five hundred dollars. Most people are using multiple roller operators, so it's maybe four or five thousand dollars. But huge difference, huge cost saving potential. And there's a few golf courses in the room that have done a lot of alternating between mowing and rolling. Um, so that was interesting. But getting back into POA versus bent. Uh, this is one of the primary weaknesses with POA annua. Forget about the fact that it's really intolerant of summer conditions, winter conditions. It produces a seed head in the spring, and we'll see that assuming it does warm up here in the next few weeks. Um, bent grass does not produce a seed head. Now we can manage this seed head with some costly materials and with some surface grooming, things like that, but it's not perfect. So we're still more apt to see bumpy conditions in that spring time frame with Poania versus pure bent greens. So there's kind of a, a, a major weakness that we, we have a good handle on how to uh, minimize it, but it's still going to be there and, and every year is going to be different. And these seed heads are, are so much dominated by the weather, so it's going to be challenging to uh, always get these things perfectly controlled. Um, when we're trying to suppress these seed heads, I mentioned it's a material. Um, bent grass versus Poania greens, you're going to be uh, applying these materials a little bit differently. And actually, bent grass, you might spend a little bit more money on what we call growth regulators, and that's what suppresses these seed heads. Uh, but on POA, it's two additional applications. So that just means it's more work for your maintenance staff to have to get out there at, at separate times uh, to make these applications. And like I said, they're not perfect. Um, thatch management between these two species is pretty much the same. Uh, bent grass greens, especially new bent grass greens, can produce more thatch. Uh, so you have to be mindful of that if you know that's what you're working with, uh, because too much thatch. And for those that don't know, it's basically I kind of have to van a white this here, but the the dark coloration at the top there, uh, that's mostly the thatch. And if that develops in excess of, uh, you know, that's way too much thatch in that profile. But if it develops too much, you're essentially playing on a mattress. And firm conditions are an unwritten rule of golf. Uh, so we don't want firm condition, or we don't want really soft conditions like that. So you have to manage that thatch. Um, so what does that mean? Core aeration and top dressing is are the best means of really managing thatch and, and making sure it doesn't develop in that mattress. Um, so that means aerating typically twice a year. Between those two species, you're going to spend about the same amount of money. Um, because bent grass can produce maybe a little bit more thatch, you might be top dressing a little bit more. Uh, so that might end up costing you maybe. Uh, you know, an extra thousand dollars or so. And again, these are generalized programs, they're not perfect by any means, but I um, feel like they're, they're still pretty accurate. Uh, within top dressing, it's important to understand we're not just using beach sand here. Uh, there's a cost to this, and, and not all sands are going to be uh, the same, so we need to make sure that we're uh, getting the right sand for our golf course. And so if you see that line item of top dressing sand on the budget, there's a reason why it's expensive. Um, it's got to be the appropriate sand. So. With these two species, you might be making a few more applications on bent grass than POA, um, but all in all, not a huge difference, maybe $1,000. All right, fertilization between these two species. The goal is kind of the three bears principle. Not too much, not too little, but 
just right. If we fertilize too much, greens are going to be growing so much where they're slow, they're, they're just uh, not going to be good conditions. If they're not fertilized enough, it's going to be like an NFL football field in between the hash marks. It's just going to slowly get worn away. Uh, so we need to fertilize our greens pretty regularly. Uh, between these two species, there is a, a minor difference. Annual bluegrass is, or pole annua is much more susceptible to a disease we call anthracnose, and that is a low fertility disease. And that's something we've known for a little while now. So we need to fertilize pole annua greens a little bit more. Um, and uh, it's not going to be too terribly expensive between those two differences, but again, slight difference there. And, um, and pole annua is going to cost a little bit more in your fertilization program. Here's one of the big ones. Poania has really, really poor uh, tolerance to dry conditions. And in the heat of the summer, when it's really hot, we can't miss watering these greens or syringing these greens, cooling them off by 30 minutes on a pole green. If we do, we'll be paying the consequences the rest of the summer. Um, and it's really challenging to do with a busy golf schedule. Uh, so we can't, we can't afford uh, to really miss this situation because you, you are going to end up uh, seeing weakened turf. Usually, Bankgrass greens, you miss it by a little bit. They might not look good for a day or two or three, but they'll come back. Uh, POA really doesn't come back after it gets too dry. So uh, the water management program, hand watering I think is crucial for every uh, putting rain situation. You need to use the automatic irrigation at some point, but also hand watering the hot spots here or there that, that dry out more quickly. Um, but for bankgrass greens, you're probably having a few guys on, on watch, so to speak, until 4 or 5 p.m. at night. For polar greens, especially in the summertime, you might have to have uh, employees at your golf course until 7 or 8 or 9 o'clock at night in some instances if it's that hot and it's that dry. Um, and that's what we call sort of this wilt watch. And that can cost an extra four to five grand. And, and the reason why it's more expensive is because this is not a job that you send you know, anyone on your crew to do. This is a specialized job where it's, it's an assistant, superintendent, you know, interns, things like that. Because the wrong person with a hose in their hand can cause some problems. Usually they apply too much water and that's where we see the issues. So major difference there, bent grass, you're going to spend a lot more money just making sure uh, it's alive. You're using more water to, to make sure it, um, it's there the next day. Okay, uh, as I alluded to, you know, hand watering is, is expensive. It's the way to go. Uh, you want to hand water as much as you can to make sure you're not overwatering things based on uh, your irrigation system. Uh, it's labor intensive, but you know, it's not uncommon for most golf courses to have you know, two employees go out and, and make sure the greens are, are where they need to be on a daily basis. Um, here's what happens at a championship level. This is the Ryder Cup this past year. Uh, it's not only are they having uh, one, you know, one person on the hose itself, but three or four others just to carry it to make sure we've, uh, we're not doing any damage to the greens. Again, this is where we, we've probably got a little bit too far in terms of how our expectations are. This is the Ryder Cup. We can't possibly do this at our golf course. But. All right, pest management. Insects, diseases, and weeds that are all impacting our putting greens. Uh, this is another major difference between bent grass and pole annua. Um, we see this particular insect, annual bluegrass weevil, causing major, major problems, not necessarily to our putting greens, but often our collars and our fairways and teeing grounds. Uh, we're treating our collars just like our greens, so uh, we're, we're worried about this pest constantly. Um, it's a really small little insect, uh, smaller than a penny, but found in high numbers, this thing can be devastating. Um, and this is really challenging to manage because we just don't understand every little thing about this insect to know how to control it perfectly every year. Uh, so bent grass, as the name would suggest, annual bluegrass weevil, it, it prefers to feed on, bent, on annual bluegrass. It will feed on bent, but the damage is usually pretty superficial and and not really even noticeable by golfers. So we're not treating for it the same by any means. Uh, on putting greens, we're usually looking at you know, maybe four uh, applications just for the ins insect. I know there's golf courses that are applying as many as 10 insecticide applications to make sure this thing doesn't cause any problems. Um, then you look at bent grass where you're applying uh, in different insecticides for like white grubs and maybe some surface feeders, some caterpillars, uh, those kind of things, far different. Um, the cost difference is only about $1,000 between these two, but you're talking three acres of greens. Uh, most of the, the, the cost with managing this insect is actually on fairways and teeing grounds where you're looking at 10 times the acreage. Uh, so huge cost difference with respect to insect uh, management between these grasses. Uh, disease prevention, again, this is a, a, an extremely detailed slide, so I'm not going to go into it, but the point being is that um, 
annual bluegrass or pole annual is much more susceptible to a host of diseases that we won't try to name them all um, compared to bent grass, which really is only going to be affected by you know, two or three or four. Uh, so that adds up pretty significantly. And we'll just talk about the number of applications that your superintendent might have to make on your golf course. For a bent grass green, you're looking at maybe 10 to 12 to maybe 13 applications on an annual basis versus polo greens where it could be upwards of 16, 17, 18, 19, maybe 20 applications uh, for diseases. So a huge cost difference. And you're, you're talking labor, time to get out there, and then obviously the, the fungicides themselves are pretty expensive. Uh, so bent grass, no question, is, is going to cost less from a fungicide standpoint. And even within the bent grass cultivar that you might have in your golf course, you might dramatically reduce how much fungicides you need. Uh, this is an image of uh, some bent grass cultivars. And the box here is actually one specific cultivar that's very susceptible to dollar spot, which is the most economically important disease that we manage in the Northeast. It's not all that devastating, but we're constantly putting something in the tank to make sure we don't see it crop up. Um, versus just to the left of that box, it's also a bentgrass cultivar, just one that's more naturally resistant. So huge cost savings potential within bentgrass and even within those different varieties. All right, this did not work. Um, this was uh, basically two pie charts comparing bentgrass and polanya greens. Uh, don't worry about the pie uh, part of it, but instead just look at the sort of the total. I only shared a few bits of information because most of the bentgrass and pole were pretty similar, um, but the big differences in cost, bentgrass you're looking at about 100,000, uh, pole you're looking at 120,000, so pole greens could roughly be 20% more expensive than bent greens. Um, the big difference that we saw in cost was in hand watering needs and in pest management. And if we think from a regulatory standpoint, what are the two things that are most likely to be affected over the next 10, 15, 20 years? It's water and our pest usage, pesticide usage, right? Um, so no question, uh, we're going to be in a better situation, more sustainable if we have more bed crash than our golf course. So a pole costs more, less reliable, and can't provide as su superior con conditions consistently over bent grass. It doesn't mean it can't be better than bent grass at times, but consistently better than bent grass. Why do we have it? Why don't we just make the change, right? It's a pretty, pretty easy question. Here's kind of the, the underlying factor, and I won't take too much of what Scott's going to talk about because he's going to really go into the nuts and bolts of a regrassing program. Um, but most of our golf courses in the Northeast have an infrastructure that is not set up for bent grass. They're old courses. A lot of trees, a lot of shade, poor soils, bad drainage. Um, it's a perfect environment for this weed to move in. So we need to make sure the infrastructure is right if we want to go in, uh, in this situation. Um, and bent grass isn't perfect. It's got limitations too, just like anything else. This is congressional in 2011. These are pretty young greens, and they were pushed pretty hard for the US Open. And you know we, they, things came back, and they had to do some um, overseeding in spots and things like that. But um, it's got limitations too. It's not perfect, but no question, it's far superior to um, the polanya, and it's going to cost you a lot less in the long run. So bottom line, you need grass to play the game of golf. You do have an option as to what grass you want. It just might, make, might take some changes within your infrastructure uh, to, to get there. So uh, with that, I'd be uh, happy to take, take some questions if we have time. Uh, if not, I'll turn it over to Scott. How are we doing on time? Okay, any questions from anyone? Coffee worth, I can tell. Yes? Uh, the comment that you made about ultimately cutting the soil, mm -hmm. it's also going to impact on the issue that you said that approach was the issue of cutting and rolling. Great, great point. I, I, uh, I missed that. Um, the, the question was, can I comment about alternating between putting green mowing and rolling and its impact on green speed and overall conditioning? Um, for the most part, if you alternate between those two, you're not going to see any difference in playability. Uh, the green speeds are not going to be noticeably faster or slower in any one situation. If your greens are excessively growing from fertilizer, a lot of rain, or they're really thatchy, then you might see a difference. But if, for the most part, your agronomic programs were pretty well in line, um, you don't have too much thatch and things aren't growing uh, you know, out of the ground excessively, you won't see really a difference. Now, if you go two days without mowing, 
you'll probably start to see a change in speed and smoothness and, and overall consistency. Uh, but for the most part, the courses that have done the alternating between mowing and rolling haven't seen any difference. Do they tend to push the height of cut down if they're doing alternating mowing and rolling? No. No, most of the time the height of cut is pretty stationary. And if you're implementing and alternating between mowing and rolling because of stress, I would argue you should probably take the mowing height up because the grass is under stress. So uh, that's the best, best thing to do. Yes. I will let Scott handle that, um, but it could be could be short. Could be short depending on how you do it. Definitely, um, you know, two months, a month and a half. Most people do it at the end of the season, so the season's done and you start playing next spring. But yes. It it's, can be a good grass when you have the right resources and the right infrastructure. That's the entire reason why they have it. The part of it also is you know, they don't want to deal with disruption of making a change. Uh, they've been able to adjust their growing environments and make sure the greens drain adequately that POA can survive. But in most golf courses, you don't have all those same factors. You've got shade. You've got poor airflow. You've got drainage problems um, that are dealing with it. And, and you don't have an army of staff to manage it to make sure that when something does come up that you're on top of it right away. So, so the answer is if you have the money and the resources, there really isn't, it isn't necessarily a reason to change. I would, yes, that's correct. If you have the money and resources to manage Poe Annua, um, you don't have motivation to change other than you know, the, the sustainability factor of you, you'd be able to still save money or reallocate money towards other things in that golf course if you had bent grass because it's going to cost less. Uh, and over time, the fungicides and the water usage that we have is going to become under, you know, the, will, will become more scrutinized. So even if you can keep it alive, that doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. It's a weak grass. Um, you know, I think it would be great for everyone to change, but that's just not, not what's going to happen. Um, it still can be a really good grass when you have the resources to do so, but it's not. Um, it's not sustainable for most people. Anything else? All right, thank you very much. Um, we'll turn it over to our, uh, our moderator. <laughs>